JC Direct this week. Purple booms. Thank you, Thrive. UK and local inflation. Chinese GDP surprises to the upside. We bar cars trading around fair value, just ahead of 20 Rand. Gold hit 2400 last week, pulled back a bit. LME bans some Russian origin metals. Hello and welcome to JC Direct, episode 583 for 18 April. My name is Simon Brown. This podcast is brought to you by JustOneLap.com. So let's kick off with some inflation and let's start with the, the UK inflation, which was frankly a bit of a surprise. Came in at 3.2%. That's the lowest in over two years. This after Fed minutes from uh, the Fed, uh, Jerome Powell, basically saying, you know what, rates aren't coming down that much of a hurry. The short answer is they're also running out of space, and I need to pull up when the FOMC meetings are. So there's one 30 April and 1st of May, and it's coming up, what, just in uh, two weeks' time. Not going to see a rate cut there. Then we've got June and July, maybe. September 17, 18, they're not going to cut there. Not six weeks ahead in an election. They'll be accused of interfering in the election. Uh, and then November 6 and 7, the election is on. If I check the calendar, the 5th of November. So perhaps the earliest they can really cut is November and then a, a, a December. In other words, only two cuts coming in. Not all these dozens of cuts we were hoping were half a dozen. Six was the expectation. Unless we see a June or July. And i got to say, I can't see either June or July happening. So by accounts, the U.S. is not cutting inflation often this year and might be until November might be the first one. And in fact, one of the big banks, and I forget which who it was in the U.S., has said they actually don't see a rate cut in the U.S. this year. The U.K. at 3.2, they're getting there. Target's 2%, wiggle room. ECB last week looking like they'll probably cut mid-year as well. So we're going to see some cutting happening in sort of Europe and the U.K. The U.S., which has got a much stronger economy, doesn't need to at this point. The economy is strong. Look, they need to. But they don't have to do it. They've got that strength in the economy, and that is so very, very important. A strong economy gives you that wiggle room. And the data just keeps on coming in and saying strong economy. Let's bring it home. We had CPR data uh, Wednesday morning for March. It was 5.3%. Expected was 54 Previous was 56 That is a good number. Absolutely it is. It's nice to see inflation coming down again. Uh, and it is, it's, it's, as I say, a, a good-looking number. The question is, is it good enough to get us to a point where we're going to see the Saab cutting? Can, if we've got Europe and the UK cutting, can we cut? Or do we need to wait for the US to be cutting? And, and I, I don't know. I mean, we'll find out in time. The target, of course, is four and a half or three to six, but the governor wants four and a half. We are getting there. But I think he's going to watch the U.S. The, and the reason is quite simple. If we start to cut, that inflation differential sort of fades away. Money rushes out of the economy into the U.S. to get their high yields. And boom, our rand weakens. And what does that do? Bring inflation. Thank you very much because, of course, we've got uh, a, a Petrol costs, diesel costs, but just generally uh, import inflation. A lot of what we use is import. So there certainly is risk there. We'll see. Uh, we've got a, some meetings. When are the most likely cuts? We've got a, an MPC, 30 May, unlikely, 18 July, maybe, uh, 19 September, and then 21 November are the dates for the MPC. Uh, where would I say? I would say first cut maybe July, probably September at best. If we don't see the U.S., we might only get November. Uh, in other words, things aren't getting better as quickly as we had hoped. I thought we might get a March cut in South Africa this year. Heck, there was th thinking that there might be a January cut in the U.S. That was truthfully never particularly likely. But let's go to China. We spoke last week that uh, Fitch had downgraded uh, China to outlook negative, and I was like, well, like really, like no one is surprised by that. Except here's the thing. GDP, so second quarter year-on-year -year GDP, 5.3%. So 5% is the target from Xi Jinping and his crew, and 53 is a good number. I've also been digging into export data because export, I first picked it up in April of last year. Month-on-month uh, -month export data and year-on-year -year export data was running negative, minus 7.5, minus 13. And that worried me, A, for China, but B, for the globe. But doing some digging into it, the volumes aren't falling. 
prices are falling. In other words, you, there's too many solar panels in the world, so how do you get yours out there? Well, you cut the price. You're getting industries to produce huge amounts. Why? Well, because you want them producing, uh, because you want economic activity in the country. Now they've got the product. Well, they've got too much. They're overstocked. What do you do when you're overstocked? Well, you sell some into, uh, at, at discount prices. And with the GDP number that just came in, it certainly seems to fit into that. Now, am I suddenly going bullish on China? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, uh, absolutely not. But certainly the China market is looking interesting. So last week, this is a weekly chart. Last week, we had the, the pullback when they got the downgrade from Fitch. But pretty much it's bounced again and given all of this back. The Chinese chart is looking interesting. Uh, I think it's independent securities. We're going to have Simon Fulham on my show next week. He's actually saying, hang on, all this negativity around China might just be wrong. In which case, well, in which case, we've got to really give some, some, some extra thought and thinking around it. Maybe it's important for us for a couple of reasons. NASPAS and process, of course. Richmond sells a truckload into China. And then just more broadly, commodities. Commodities all around China. What we have seen is the PGM run of last week. Yeah, nice, but it has pulled back to a degree. Uh, what we're seeing is oil still just remains. Let's have a quick look at the gold chart. So gold, gold remains strong. Gold is absolutely doing everything. Uh, my target on gold remains 2,500, and that looks like we're going to get there soon enough. This is a gold spot, not futures price. Futures is a little bit higher. Uh, we had that consolidation at around 2,000. Then we had a consolidation at around 2,200. It now looks like we might get a consolidation around 2,400. 25 is my target. Thereafter, I don't know how to do targets like that. My charting is really, really simple. I honestly just don't know where to take the target next. The big story, of course, over the, re the weekend was the attack on Israel by Iran. 300-odd drones. Most of them didn't get through. It was well expected. Uh, Israel had attacked and uh, by reports destroyed the Iranian embassy in Damascus, Syria, and therefore there needed to be some retaliation by rules of war and other such nonsense. And it happened. What we have seen is oil is kind of staying at that consolidating around that 90 level. Interestingly, both Jordan and Saudi Arabia were assisting against Iran in that drone attack. Now, Syria, of course, very much on Iran's side, so is Lebanon, but neither of those are political or economic powerhouses or, or military powerhouses in any sense of, of it being. Syria's got their own civil war, which they're bu busy fighting. But oil certainly is looking like it, 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 it's found a comfort level at 90, and if anything, next stop's probably 94, 95, uh, and if that goes, then we are probably looking at around about the 97, 98, maybe even 100. And that's not good on any measure, none whatsoever. As I said, late last week we were seeing oil running. We saw gold run hard in the anticipation of the Iranian attack on Israel. Uh, that having happened, we've seen pullbacks in both, although not massive pullbacks by any stretch of imagination. The pullbacks have truthfully been a little bit uh, modest. It was kind of very much hyped and then kind of, didn't really live up to it. 300 odd drones, which is a lot, I suppose, but by accounts, like a handful actually got through defenses. So not much. Question is, does Israel retaliate? I don't know. I, I, I'm not a, a war gamer here. I'm not going to go down that one. We buy cars. We've got the, the listing. It came out uh, Thursday last week, so that was after I had done the show. Uh, you were getting about 0.34 We Buy Cars for every transaction capital that you have held. They are now trading. And the question that everyone's asking is, am I liking slash buying We Buy Cars? Look, I like the business model. I, owe, I hold CMH. They've got Second-hand cars, they've got new cars, most notably Suzuki's, which you see everywhere on the roads, and they've got really good uh, rental business. Of course, there's Motus as well, and there's Bits Supergroup's got some vehicle as well, but it's, it's CMH and uh, uh, Motus. We Buy Cars is different in that they are pure second-hand cars. The fair value here is probably around about 20. Uh, they are looking to pick up market share, and I've spoken before how I think they can do that. To the question, am I buying? I'm still expecting a bit of price weakness. There'll be a lot of folks who got the We Buy Cars uh, last week and are saying, 
Uh, okay, not sure about that, although truthfully, we'll talk about what you've got left in transaction capital in a moment. But anyway, there's certainly some out there. I want to see a clean set of numbers. I want to see a set of results. I want to, you know, and that maybe means a, a higher price. But in a market with the consumer under pressure, I think I've got time on my side because, as I said, it's going to be market share, which really works. Transaction capital, which obviously unbundled the We Buy Cars. So you got. We buy cars, call it 2050, you got 0.34, uh, I need to do my math better, this is hard in the head, so about 6 rand 97, uh, plus you've got 2 rand 54, so you've got about 9 rand 50 of value, it's not exciting, you were 10 rand and change at the close on Wednesday, so you're about 10% down. I've been asked by a lot of folks, am I buying transaction capital, am I brave, am I a gambler, the answer is no, no, and no. I am onto gambler. I am not brave in the stock market environment. And I, what's left here? We've got some Newton. Now, of course, they've solved the Australian operations. We've got SA Taxi. I would want to, again, see some clean numbers here. But SA Taxi is not getting better in a hurry. So, really, they've just got Newton. Now, Newton's a good business. Although, as I say, they've sold the Australian, but it is a good business. But I'm not sure that it's good enough for me to go rush out. And in essence, just take a gamble on, on we buy cars, or well, sorry, transaction capital, uh, SA Taxi, and where it's going next. That's absolutely not the sort of game that I like to play by any stretch of imagination. So I leave that well alone. Uh, we've got a couple of events up on the, the, the website for folks, uh, three of them in total. Uh, the first one is today, which is the 18th. That is assuming that you are around and listening to this on the day that we publish the podcast. If you are, we are having a power hour. We are getting uh, really great numbers on the webcast. We're getting good numbers on people coming through to uh, Standard Bank and Baker Street, Rosebank. Uh, it's going to be getting started in shares. I've been putting together the presentation. How do we structure portfolios? How do we manage tax? What about ETFs and ETPs and ETNs and all the other ETs and bits and pieces? Uh, what about risks and markets? How do we manage those risks and all of that? So that's available. Next Tuesday, I'm going to be chatting with uh, one invest, uh, Ryan Basido. He is uh, one invest. We're going to be talking there offshore. So S and P 500, the tech one, the Infotech uh, ETF, which is best performing over five years. We're also going to be touching on their uh, uh, SRI, socially responsible index. It's an MSCI global index, and then the emerging market Asia one at the same time. That is next uh, Tuesday, uh, 23rd at 11. And then we've got on the 28th of May, we're going to be talking commodities with one invest, Johanna Rasmus. They've got a bunch of commodities. They've got the gold, the oil, the copper, uh, the PGMs, including rhodium, platinum, palladium. We'll be talking about that as well. Just onelap.com slash events for more information and booking. So Purple Capital results. Uh, I hold Purple Capital for disclaimer nice and front, right up front. Uh, so... Swing back to profit, which was a surprise. The uh, trading update came out on Friday afternoon, and the stock just started running. It absolutely started running. As the market were like, yo, we didn't expect them to start making money again. What is happening here? Now, there is a story as to what is happening here. Let's not get too carried away. We'll touch on that in a moment. But it was a good set of numbers. There's no doubt around that. We, we, we can't say that, that, that these were, in any sense, disappointing. The, the stock has run hard, trading at 94, as I recall, Wednesday afternoon. It's been up at 105, but it was 70 cents last week, which itself was nicely up on the, I think, 53 cents was the low back in late February. February, yep, sorry, 46 was the low. I didn't buy, folks is asking if I bought more. I bought a bunch at 50 cents way back. I sold a bunch of that at around 3.15. I've held the rest. So I'm back in the money briefly there late Feb. I was underwater with it. Um, but the chart action is looking good. The 94 level is an important number it needs to get through. I do think we'll see some pullback. There is certainly some selling, on the, some sellers on the sell side, but there is big buyers, particularly at 90 cents, 628,000 at that price point. We'll see how it goes, but uh, that certainly is, is, is looking very promising in that regard. But the numbers, so let's delve into the numbers. So, I mean, overall, uh, what we've got, revenue up 29% at 189 million. That's really good. Uh, 
costs essentially flat. You expect that. There's a couple of things that are working in their favor here. They're getting efficiencies of scale. They're also just getting better at onboarding and managing customers. Uh, so headline earnings came in at 0.78 cents. That after a loss for the corresponding six months to February 23 of 0.84 cents. Nice. Uh, Easy Equities itself did 165 million, that's 35% higher. They've got 944,000 active accounts, that's up 12.5%. They've got 2.1 million accounts in total, uh, but you know, what, one point, I mean, yeah, over a million of those are not active. They haven't funded the account. I asked Charles what they do about that. He said, look, there's not a heck of a lot we can really, really do. Um, institutional revenue is looking quite nice. Uh, the activity-based revenue uh, jumped up, but non-activity-based. So here's the big swing. Remember October last year, Thrive which they called a loyalty program. It's not. It's an inactivity fee. You pay 25 bucks a month if you don't meet certain criteria. If you're under 21 or over 65, you don't pay. If you max out your tax free, you don't pay. And then if you do other bits and pieces, you don't pay. Ask Charles how many people are paying. He said about half. But it's about half of a, of a group that can pay, right? You, not the over 65s, the under 21s, the max out tax frees. He wouldn't give me specifics, but let's be generous and say that half of the of the, of, the, of their universe is liable for the fee uh, at twenty five rand a month. That's about six million a month. How much money did they make? Twelve. That was their profit. Twelve million, and they're making six from Thrive. So Thrive is what saved them. What we didn't see was a mass outflow of of users. Remember, everyone was saying, "I'm out of here." The point was, where were you going? So the 0.25%, there are a couple of offer, places that will offer that to you. Absolutely easy enough. In fact, there's some that are even a little bit cheaper. Do they do it without admin fee? And what about minimums? 0.25 tr transaction fee is nice, but if there's a 100 grand minimum, you've got to do a 40 grand trade to get that 0.25. And then, of course, they do fractionals at the same time. And they've also got crypto and all the rest, and, and those are doing, crypto is doing well, Easy Properties is doing so far, uh, doing a bit, 2.17 million accounts, but only 944 are actually active. But to this number here, so the uh, activity-based revenue is transaction fees, and what we're seeing for the first time is that non-activity is ahead of that, and that is the Thrive money. I think they're easily doing six million a month, uh, and I think it's coming from Thrive, and that is really what's boosted them. You know what? I suppose this is you know you've got to make profit. I mean the number is up thirty seven million. Easily half of that is a, is applicable to Thrive. The uh, increase in activity based revenue is up only seven million. Call that ten percent. But there's some th one or two other points. So Easy Protect and Easy Credit, both very new products to the market, but only thirty one. Uh, easy protect uh, uh, policies, 31. Uh, revenue premium per month, 190 bucks. It's like 70 grand a year. Early days, but yeah. Uh, easy credit, 209 loans. Average size is 12,000, 2.5 million loaned in total. Again, very, very small. Again, late in the period. This is six months to end February. Uh, these are late to the party, but still tiny. Can they scale? Easy property, easy crypto, yes. Easy property, and the jury's still out. I mean, GT, also tiny, very, very small. But here's what I want to. They do a whole bunch of stuff around uh, cohorts, and that's massively interesting. Cohorts are essentially what was the year that you came in uh, and how do they then track you. Uh, what I'm looking for is this one here. So this goes back to 28 million. Uh, retail clients buy uh, uh, assets by, by cohorts. So in 2018, year to date, it was 2 billion. Now it's 35 billion. Make no mistake, that is a massive jump. These teal, green, sea-colored ones are the 2020 cohorts. They are the folks that came in during a pandemic. They are the folks who bought uh, uh, Sassel at 20 bucks and sold it at 100. Charles once told me they made, his clients made about a billion rand on Sassel, and not paper money, locked in profits on Sassel. Here are asset growth per cohort. So these, the, the purple line up here is the 2015 cohorts, which was their first year of operation, and their asset growth is up 6x over a decade. Fair enough. Makes perfect sense. Uh, we've got the 2016s. They're only up 4x in their period. That makes a bit of sense. 2016 was not a fun year to come to market, but what we're seeing is typically really nice growth. But that 2020 cohorts, again, this teal color lurking there, they've gone sideways for the last two years. 
they're not even at 2x their, their, assets under man, their, 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 their asset growth. It hasn't even doubled yet. I know it's early days. I asked Charles around about this, and he was like, you know what? It's tough out there. It's tough being a consumer. Uh, you know, all of those stories. I get it. But that is by a long way, as we can see from this chart, there's significant block. We need, is there something to be worried about here? Charles says no. It's just tough conditions. But you know what? It's kind of tough for everyone. And yet, if we look, all the other cohorts, not all of them, the 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, uh, 21 cohorts all went up. The 2020 cohorts didn't. That, that I don't want, it, it doesn't worry me. It's something I'm going to keep an eye on. What I do like is Easy Equities or Purple are doing great uh, reports. I hope they continue to include this chart in it. If not, I will ask about it at future sets of results. Short answer is a good set of numbers. Can't argue with the numbers. As a shareholder, I'm happy. Nothing I'm going to argue about that. I thought they were a great set of results. Uh, and and they're certainly they surprised the market. As I said, expect some pullback on the price. Absolutely, it's run hard. Uh, we've got to flush out a lot of stale bulls and the like. But generally, it's looking good. Remember those events, just one lap.com slash events. We've got one today, 18th, 23rd, and then 28th. And we'll have another one on the 17th of May. We're finalizing speakers, another power hour. Uh, and that will be, again, webcast and at Standard Bank, head office, Baker Street, Rosebank. But until then, we will leave it. My name is Simon. We'll chat again next week. If you can, look after yourself. Uh, and if possible, look after somebody else as well. Cheers all.